This message entitled TMICOR 2.33, A Hinged Life, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on March 7th, 2021 by the Reverend Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is John 18, 28 to 40. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evil doer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Thank you. Dear Lord, we, we come before you even in this time and at this place and we desire, dear God, for your spirit to open up these things uh, and uh, bring them into our hearts and help us to see what's really going on as Jesus makes his way to the cross. Uh, Lord, we only have a few Sundays before we get to uh, Easter, and so there's really no way we can cover every little story that's in these Gospels. Uh, and certainly, if we were to put all the Gospels together, there are there's just not enough Sundays to do it. So, Lord, we look for your leading on this. Would you, dear God, please show us which ones to take a look at in this season of Lent. Help us, dear God, to... Uh, open up, or have you open up, dear God, in our understanding uh, how in the world, or really how out of this world uh, things are. And I pray, dear God, that you would uh, touch us in a very powerful way with your truth. Help us, dear God, to stay hinged to our faith, hinged to our God, hinged to his word. I pray, dear God, that we would uh, not shudder and shake and, and uh, make all kinds of racket and noise because our hinges are loose. I pray, dear God, Lord, that they would be uh, tightened up, that they would be fixed, that we wouldn't wait for the whole thing to fall apart. We would go ahead and uh, take responsibility for it and, um, and get it so the, so the door, dear God, to the kingdom of God uh, opens easily. And I pray, dear God, that you would 
uh, be the one glorified as we look to you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. The uh, title, as you, can say, as you can see, is T-M-I-C-O-R 2.33. And then the second half of the title is A Hinged Life. Now that first part, I don't know about for you, but it sure sounds like some kind of computer address or something. We were talking about this a little bit earlier when we were first getting here. Um, and that's what it sounds like. You know, it's got these letters that you can't even pronounce. And then it's got this 2.33, you know, it's like, you know, Expect an update tonight, you know, and this is going to be iOS, blah, blah, and there's just a, you know, and all this computer stuff. Uh, and that's what it sounds like. T-M-I-C-O-R 2.33. That's the, uh, sh sure sounds like a computer address to me. But it turns out it's not. Did you have any doubt? Because I don't know any computer addresses. So <laughs> forget it. No, that's not what it is. Stories told about one couple, they were having a problem making their bank account uh, come out right. Uh, they were having a problem keeping it, what they call reconciled, you know, right on your checkbook, right on your register, it'll say, don't forget to uh, reckon, or, you know, your register, to go through it every month, compare it to the bank, and, and make sure you're right on, Okay. Well, this couple was having a problem with it. Quite frankly, uh, she was the one who was handling all of the stuff and she was writing checks when there wasn't money in there and so forth. I'm not condemning her or anything. But, you know, uh, Cindy and I decided early on that I was handling all of that. And I took care of the checkbook. I, take care, I took care of the writing of the checks and paying the bills and utilities and everything. And uh, not that she couldn't have done it. Of course she could have done it. You know, she, was, she always told me she was smarter than me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she got better grades in high school and so forth, in college and so forth. Um, no, I never admitted to any of that, never let her buy with it. But she always tried to make it clear she was smarter. <laughs> I'm teasing. Her husband suggested that she balance the account. I don't know how much she was trying to do that, to balance the account every month, and that she should, that would solve the problem. Well, the wife agreed to try it. So she got out the calculator and got to work. The next night, her husband came home from work, and she gladly announced, Jeremy, it worked out. It really worked out. Let me see it, was all that he could think to say. She proudly handed him the checkbook, he looked at it, sure enough, you're right, my dear, it checks right out, but I'm a little puzzled here. There is this, what does this mean? You've got written here, T-M-I-C-O-R 2.33. What does that stand for? Well, she said, to be perfectly honest, I couldn't quite get it to come out exactly, so I added that on the, in the register. T-M-I-C-O-R simply means to make it come out right. Here you thought it was going to be deeper than that, didn't you? Uh, to make it come out right. And the 2.33, of course, was how much the account was off. <laughs> All right. Now, I can identify with that. I know for years, I mean, even until just recently, I would work on that. I would get hold of the statement. I would, you know add, subtract, and redo, and, and I could spend hours looking for a penny. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> I, I think my time's worth more than that, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I would work on it until I would get it to balance to the penny. But now I'm content to use the T-M-I-C-O-R approach to make it come out right. After all, the bank is better at all that stuff than I am. And besides that, I do think I got other things to do. <laughs> okay? And it's always been, 
I mean, the bank has always been right. They're not just, I mean, in my case, they've always been right. Now, maybe they haven't in yours and you don't trust them. So you make sure that it comes out even and so forth. But a lot of times I will be off like this, $2.33 or whatever. And it's going to mean to go through the whole list again and check the addition and check the subtraction and check, you know, whether I have, uh, you know, some other check in there that I forgot to write in or deal with or whatever. So I don't, I don't bother anymore, quite frankly. Um, but it's a good point that she makes, okay, to make it come out right, to make it come out right. As I said, I have always found the bank to be right. And so that's almost like God, okay? <laughs> it's not really God, but it's almost like God. And God knows best, okay? And so I'll go ahead and add the $2.33 or subtract the $2.33. And uh, that makes it come out right. But you got to make sure you're right. Because if you let it go for month after month after month or year after year or whatever, and you're not paying any attention to it, you may think you have enough money in there for something that you're buying and you don't. And before you know it, you got a check that you have that bounced, okay? And then you have a charge for that and it's not worth it. So just make it come out right, okay? That's the way I look at it. Now, what about things around the house? I mentioned this to some extent with the kids here this morning in the children's sermon. But I ask the question of all of you now. Have you ever been aware of something in the house that needs to be fixed, but you have a tendency to put it off, you just don't get to it, and eventually it breaks even worse than it already was, and that makes the repair even more of a job. It might even cost more to fix. It might even, you know, it, it, it can... Make it worse than it was if you don't get to it, okay? Right now, as I told them, I have a hinge coming loose on my back door. It clunks, it shakes, it shudders. When you go to open it, it's not, you know, fastened clearly to the door jam, and so it bounces around a little bit, makes a lot of noise. And eventually, all three screws will pull, uh, pull out. I've noticed the top one. It, it, you, could, you could pull it out with your fingers. You wouldn't have to have a pair of pliers it would, or a screwdriver. You could just pull it out. I see it's that loose, okay? Uh, but I'll have more of a fix-it job if I don't do something about it. I wonder how long I will put it off. Because I've got several other things that I've let go for quite some time, and I'm getting to those. I'll go ahead and mention one of them to you. It's been a long time since our curtains have been washed. Cindy's the last one that did it. She's the one who always did it. And it's been years since she did it. Okay? And they're looking a little dungy and dusty. And you can look on the top of the, you know, on the valence thing and so forth. And there's actual dust up there. And so, but it doesn't do any good just to vacuum it off or, or knock it off or uh, whatever. So I decided to do what she used to do. Only I forgot that she mentioned that the last time she did the curtains that they weren't holding up real well. I put them in the washer and I knew, I knew, I knew it would have been better to hand wash them. I knew that, but I know she always had them in the washer. But she might have had them on a different cycle. I don't know. Anyway, I go to pull the whole thing out and half of them are shredded. Shredded. I mean like a whole, you know, came apart, not at the seams, came apart in the middle of the material. You know, so there's all the, so I thought, that's it. I'm going to have to buy new ones. And I haven't even done all of them. I just did the dining room, the kitchen, and the laundry room and the bathroom downstairs. I didn't get to the living room and I didn't go upstairs yet. So they're all like, I got to get to them yet. Well, anyway, so I go ahead and I thought, this is crazy. So I balled them all up and I threw them in the trash and literally took it out to the trash can. It was trash. So I go over to Walmart. Do they have the same thing? No. Do they have anything close? No. They do have some shears, but they were like, I don't know, seven something a piece or something and that's per panel. So it's one panel, another panel, and that's one window. There's $14 right there. I bought $30 worth of curtains, brought them home, Got looking at, I didn't open them up, but I did look at them, and according to the picture, 
they have those rings on the top and then your curtain rod goes through. And, and then they have other ones that are there that aren't shears, but they have grommets, great big grommets in them. And then your curtain rod goes through that and it hangs by that. Well, that's all different from the way we had it, we had it done. So I thought for a minute and I thought, you know what? I'm not going to throw them out. I decided this when I was in Walmart. I went ahead and bought the other ones anyway, but I took them back. Anyway, so I uh, decided that I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to buy new ones. So I got them out of the trash. I laid them out. Okay, they're still a little bit damp, but not bad. And, uh, and I know Cindy used to put them up and let them hang and dry. It was the easiest thing. Plus, it'll hang right at that, you know, in that way. Anyway, so I got looking at the first one I was putting up. And it's kind of as I suspected. There's so much material, and you crunch it down to here. You got those, you know, what do you? I don't know what you call them, but you got your your waves in your curtain. And if you put that just right, you can't see the tears. You can't see where it ripped on really most of them. There's one in the in the in the uh, you know. Um, laundry room that's uh, not real hidden. <laughs> you know that there's a problem there. But who sees the washer and dryer? Me. Do I care? No. <laughs> so that's the way it is right now. I might put something else up there or whatever, but now that's the most obvious one. All the others worked out so the tear is in the back and you don't even see them. And now they're nice and bright and white and they look great. So there you go. Make it come out right. Okay? The idea was clean. The idea was to be white and no dust and so forth. Make it come out right. All right? Uh, if uh, I think what I'm going to do, and I should have done this before, I know, but I think what I'm going to do with the other curtains, I'm still going to take them down because I want to make them right. I want to make them white. I want to make them clean. Okay? and I'm gonna hand wash them. And then after I hand wash them, I'm gonna hang them once I wring them out. But I'm gonna wring gently. <laughs> if I start to hear when I'm ringing, no good. <laughs> so, you know, we'll be okay, I'll get it. And then I put paint on the windowsills and just cleaned up here and there and vacuumed and, and so forth. And I'm doing the whole house, room at a time. Okay, one room a day. I got, I got other things to do. I got to get ready for church. I got to get ready for Bible study and so forth. There's other things to do. Now imagine when I get back to doing the nursing homes and I got all that, which was always on top of all of this. Well, so the house better be right. It better be clean. And I, and in my mind, it honors her because she was the one who did all of that. All of that. Oh, I helped her a couple of times. That's probably what's wrong. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, I'd take them down for her and we'd get them in the washer. And she did, she used the washer all the time. And it only just the last time started to not do well. And I forgot about that temporarily. And now, now they're all, now they're ripped up pretty good. But not real bad. One or two big rips in every curtain, you know. And I got that back behind so you can't see it. And that makes it right. I know it'd be perfect to have all brand new, you know, drapes and curtains and all the rest of it, but, uh, you know, it will be fine. And, and they look nice and clean, too. <laughs> all right, praise God. Well, those, that's what I'm talking about. You got the hinges, you got your curtains, you know, and make it come out right. Okay? So that's what uh, I've been about with all of this. All right. So that's the, that's the illustration from the house itself. Uh, and, and it probably will take me longer than one room a day, but it's okay, as long as I keep at it. All right. I wonder how long uh, I could go with that, you know? <laughs> could I stretch it out to do one room a year? <laughs> See, we have a tendency to do that kind of stuff, you know? Because we don't really feel like it. It doesn't seem fun. 
you know. And now spring's coming, and guess who's going to have to get out and get the tractor going and mow and and pull weeds and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. These are all things she did before. And I especially talk about the weeds. I don't know how she did it. She had enough energy to do that kind of stuff until the end. Of course, you know, later it got harder and worse. But anyway, I'm so very thankful for all that we did. We were able to get done. And now I just got to jump into it. Okay? <laughs> All right, well, turns out that in this Lenten season, we're going to be going through on, a, on the road right to the cross, and we're going to specifically, right today, look at Jesus' appearance before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Turns out there are three hinge pins, or three hinges, however you want to look at it, uh, that are working their way out of the hinges. And the question then becomes, what can be done about them? And when that can that be done? Well, no sense in putting it off. It's time to deal with the hinges. All right? So let's look at the first one. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the judgment hall. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. Imagine, these religious leaders are worried about being defiled when they're in the process of trying to kill Jesus. And they wanted to be able to eat the Passover, you know, and I won't be able to eat the Passover if we, you know, don't do things right. But you see, the problem is there's man's right and then there's God's right, <laughs> okay? My whole purpose in the curtains was to get them clean to get them white, to have it look almost new again. And whatever it takes to do that, you can do it. The religious leaders, and like I said, the ones I did buy at Walmart, they wouldn't look the same. They, they weren't even the same thing. And so I think it honors Cindy, who dealt with all these things for so long, to keep try to keep it as long as I can. Anyway. The religious leaders would like everybody to think that they are intent on mercy and honesty when they were actually proving that they are about the opposite. Heaven forbid that they should get sullied, that they should get contaminated in their plan when really their plan is nothing but a pile of deception. Okay? Imagine, you know, you got to, you know, do it this way or do it that way so we don't get in trouble for trying to kill Jesus. You know, talk about def being defiled already. Well, turns out that Pilate got the ball rolling by asking the Jews this question. Look at verse 29. What accusation bring ye against this man? What accusation? What, what are you accusing him of? Now, in the Greek, this word for accusation is categorio. Could you have any kind of guess as to what that is in our English language? Categorio? What about category? What category of charge are you bringing against this man? In other words, what is your complaint? What do you think he's done wrong? Why are you trying to get him on this one? Okay, and what's their response? If he were not a malefactor, and literally in the Greek, that means evildoer or bad doer, or simply put, criminal. Okay. In other words, they're saying, if he weren't a criminal, we would not have delivered him up to thee. And I got it written in my margin, and I wrote it right here in my notes. Yeah, right. I mean, come on, who do you think you're fooling? It might have fooled a lot of people, but it's not fooling God, and it's not fooling Jesus. Okay, We would not have delivered him up to you if we didn't think he was a bad guy. Yeah, right. Then Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your own law. Okay? The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Does that give you any clue as to what their plan was? Their plan was to get rid of him, was to kill him. Now, how is that a good thing? You see what I'm saying? Do you see how phony, do you see how deceptive these religious leaders are being? If they can't legally get rid of Jesus, 
then they have to be dishonest about the whole thing in order to get rid of him. Jesus had said that he was going to be going to a cross. And since only the Romans could crucify people, all right, they came to the Roman governor. The whole thing was an act. The whole thing was a plot. And then it happened. Look at verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And, and this, my friends, I believe is the first hinge pin. This is the first hinge itself, really, on the door to the kingdom of God. That's really the first hinge. Are you a king? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you mean to put forth? Okay? I want you to notice just how personal Jesus says that has to be. Okay? Sayest thou, verse 34, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? In other words, Jesus is saying, did you come up with that yourself? Or did somebody else tell you that? Are you just going by word of mouth? Are you just going by, you know, hearsay? Do you, do you think I'm a king? Why are you asking? Okay. In other words, did you, did you come up with this thing, Pilate? Or did somebody else mention it to you that I said that I was a king? Pilate, it's got to be a personal revelation. Because it isn't just common knowledge. To know who Jesus is, is not common knowledge. And it certainly isn't common knowledge today. We've been talking all the way through this uh, uh, season of Epiphany and so forth about Jesus being the I Am. Remember, we've, we've run across it a lot in the Gospel of John. I Am. We even have it on, a, on, a, on the wall in that back room over there, be still and know that I am God. Amen? And that's all through the scriptures. I told you I could probably go to any chapter in the Bible and find something about who God is or who Jesus is. All right? And then Pilate responded. He objected. He said, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? In other words, what in the world have you done to get these people this mad at you? In fact, this is actually the point. This is actually the point. As we come to the second hinge, the first hinge was, are you a king? The second hinge pin Okay, we have, uh, we, that we find nothing has to do with this world. Okay, see, he's basic, Pilate is basically asking, what in the world have you done? The point is, it's not in the world. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Okay, so get that idea out of your head like right now Jesus is saying. It has nothing to do with this world. Um, Jesus answered, Jesus, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my, my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Dr. Donald Stamps, that's the fellow that, uh, edited the, uh, full life Bible or study Bible. Uh, he wrote this, he said, concerning the true nature of Christ's kingdom and its redemptive purpose, this should be observed. It did not originate in this world, nor does it seek to take over this world's system. And that's what a lot of people have wrong today. They think Christianity is going to somehow change the world and make it, you know, basically heaven on earth. No, there's going to be junk until this is all over. Did you ever wonder why Jesus never said anything against slavery? Or Paul, for that matter. They had it. They had slavery. But they didn't come against it. It was part of the system. Okay? And it was all going to get ironed out in the end. But Jesus didn't rant and rave and carry on about issues and, you know, that kind of stuff. 
Jesus did not come to establish a religio-political theocracy or aspire to world dominion, like the Christians are going to take over the world. That's not biblical. The fact is, it's going to get worse and worse. It's already getting worse, and it's just going to get worse and worse. There are people that are just not going to listen to God. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get out there and you give them the truth and so forth. They've got to be able to decide from the false to the true, you see. So they've got to hear the truth. Jesus states, this is, he goes on, he says, Jesus states that if he had come to establish a political kingdom on the earth, then would his servants fight. Since this is not the nature of the kingdom, they do not resort to war or revolution to promote Christ's purposes on earth. They do not ally themselves with political parties, social pressure groups, or any secular organizations in order to establish God's kingdom. They refuse to turn the cross into a boastful attempt to rule society. Jesus' followers are armed with spiritual weapons. This, of course, does not mean that Jesus' disciples are indifferent to God's demand for just government, justice, peace, or curtailing lawlessness, okay? But understand, you know, Satan is the god of this world. And he's not going to let up. Okay? So our prayer is that God will make his kingdom obvious. Amen? But we're not going to fix everything. You know? I talk about these hinges and stuff. You know, fix them while these things are broken, okay? And you can fix a hinge, and you can put a new hinge on it, and you can tighten it up, put different screws in it. You can do all these things. Okay, but you're not going to be able to stop the denigration of um, of even stuff in the world. You know, there's going to be a day when this church is no longer standing. It's going to eventually, you know, be empty. I'm I'm just talking in the future. Could be 10, 15, 20 years. Could be 100 years or whatever. But nothing stays the same. Everything is on a downward spiral, okay? Things are getting worse. The Bible says that clearly. So you're not going to all of a sudden fix that. You need to go ahead and just be about it God's way and, and give people the truth. And then they have to decide what they're going to do with it, okay? But I think that's important because there's a, uh, there's a certain theology that's out there now. It's uh, kingdom dominion theology and there are certain preachers and they're mostly um, <coughs> prosperity type preachers and so forth you know this is going to get better and that's going to get better no the bible says things are waxing worse and it's not up to the church to make it wax better it's going to happen and stuff disintegrates we disintegrate from the minute you're born to the next minute to the next minute to the next minute. There's, you know, there's things that are going to go away. There are things, you know, you're, once you're born, you're heading towards death. I know that sounds, you know, not, hap not a happy thought, but it's true. You know, once you're born, you're heading to the, to the grave. I mean, you know that. So it's not like you're going to fix all that and get rid of death. That's not going to happen. Okay? Praise God. All right. So it's important to understand that. Christ's kingdom. Well, what is Christ's kingdom? We've just seen what Christ's kingdom is not. Christ's kingdom involves his rule, his lordship, his power, his spiritual activity in the lives and the hearts of all those who truly receive him and obey his word of truth. The church's role is that of a bondservant. We're not the bosses. Okay? We're, a, we're a slave, we're a servant to Jesus Christ, not that of a ruler in a present world. And that's what this kingdom theology stuff that's out there nowadays is wrong about. We're, we're not going to fix everything. We need to give them Jesus. Amen? Somebody lets that fix them, somebody lets that turn their minds around and, and take God seriously, terrific. But 
you know, we are not going to jump into this thing and, and force people to uh, do this or that. It's not a matter of being a ruler in this present world. The church's strength is not worldly power. But in the cross and resurrection, her suffering and rejection at the hands of the world are actually her glory. That's actually her glory. Only in renouncing worldly ways did the, did the New Testament church find God's power. The church today faces the same choice. Only by losing her life in the world will she find herself in God. Amen? That's really what the gospel is all about. We must make sure that this hinge pin is secure. That's part of our responsibility. And that's why when we just let a hinge go and let it get worse and worse and worse, we're going to make things worse. We're not supposed to be making things worse. Amen? Things are going to get bad no matter what. All right but also in the future, okay? Christ's kingdom and rule will be ultimately over a new heaven and a new earth. And this will occur after the rapture, which is a matter of the catching up of the true faithful believers, as we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, at his second coming to the earth, uh, when he will ju judge the nations and he'll destroy the Antichrist, and rule on the earth for a thousand years. But that's God doing that. That's not you. That's God doing it, and it's not me. We're working with him, but it's God doing it. And that's important to see. And then bring Satan to a final end in the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11, through chapter 20, verse 15. Praise the Lord for that crucial second hinge. All right? Oddly enough, this is when our text reverts back to the first pin, the first hinge, which I think is unusual. Uh, it had hinge one, and then hinge two, and then he goes back and talks again about hinge one. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And I think it's probably just to make sure that there's no jiggling, there's no loosening of the screw, that everything's staying good, everything's staying right is maybe a better way to put it. But this is when Pilate said, art thou a king then? See, that was the first hinge. That was the first hinge pin, even. Then it went on to the second thing, and now it goes back to the first one, okay? And Pilate then says, are you a king then? Let's go back to this first point. Are you a king? And Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am, this is verse 37, in case you've lost it. Verse 37, Thou sayest that I am, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should, I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Verse 38. Now come, so now he was in the, back to the first hinge pin, but now he jumps back over to the last hinge, to the third one. Okay? Imagine. Every, now, every word that this little toddler spoke from his first words on and through his life, because we know from the scriptures, the Bible says he never sinned. Jesus never sinned. So his first words, his second words, his third words, all his words, ever, all through his days, okay, have been the truth. In fact, it was the truth of all the universe that was standing right before Pilate and the governor had not even recognized it. You know, he's, he's what is truth? Almost sarcastically. You can almost hear it in his voice. I don't want to make it up, but, you know, what is truth? What is truth? Notice that he didn't even give Jesus time enough to answer his question. He asks what is truth, but he doesn't give Jesus any time to even say anything about it. He just went out and did his own thing. You see, at that point, Pilate went back out to the Jews and said to them, statement of fact, I find in him no fault at all. I don't, you guys think there's a whole bunch of stuff wrong with this guy? 
I don't see it. I don't find it. Okay? We are told here in John's gospel, now listen carefully, that Pilate was willing to release Jesus. Comes right out and says he was willing to release Jesus. But in Mark chapter 15, verse 15, we find that the governor was also willing to content the people. And you can't do both. That's the thing. You can't do both. You're either going to let them go or you're not. Okay? For they are the opposite of each other, actually. And this is when the Roman leaders suggested that they revert, the whole process here then revert back to an old custom. To an old custom. That of giving the people a choice. Now I can tell you right up front, that's a bad move. You give the people a choice, they're generally going to choose something that they shouldn't. You know, that's the way it is. You know, because there's a sin nature. And, you know, it's, and especially when it comes to you, do you want, do you want Jesus to die or, you know, or no? You know, well, yeah, we want him dead. We want him dead. Because he was very convicting, you know? He was very convicting. And they were sick of him. They didn't want to hear another word out of this guy's mouth. That's why, that's why uh, Pilate is actually asking, what is truth? You talk about truth. What is truth? Your truth is not my truth. Everybody's got a different truth. Everybody's allowed to have their own truth. You know, baloney. You know, lunch meat time, people. No. That's not true. So it was a bad move to give them their way. In the Greek, the word custom is literally something to which people have become or grown, as we say today, have grown accustomed. Okay? And that's a common practice. Okay? So it becomes the people's choice. All right? Barabbas is an imprisoned robber an insurrectionist, murderer even. And then there's Jesus, the only one in the whole world who is totally innocent. And they're supposed to choose who should live or die. Okay? I think it's interesting, and I've mentioned this part before. Uh, in a sense, they had the same name, and I don't believe that's by accident. I think that is meant to say something. Barabbas that they're talking about here you know, letting him go instead of Jesus. In the Hebrew, literally means son of the father. Bar, Barabbas, B-A-R, is son, okay? And then Abba is father. So Barabbas or Barabbas, okay, literally means son of the father, okay? While Jesus actually was the son of father God. And I don't think that's happenstance. I don't think that's, you know, I think that's on purpose. They had a choice. Son of the Father or Son of the Father? A.W. Tozer, you know, the great CMA preacher of the last century, he put it this way. He said, the Bible teaches that God is love. Some have interpreted this in such a way as to virtually deny that he is just because people do deserve punishment. People do deserve to have problems because of their choices, okay? Some have interpreted that he is love. They have interpreted that to virtually deny that he is just, which, by the way, the Bible also teaches. It teaches he's love and that he's just. See, God can do both. People can't. Amen? God can be both. Others press the biblical doctrine, now listen, doctrine of God's goodness so far that it is made to contradict his holiness. Or they make his compassion cancel out his truth. Still others understand the sovereignty of God in a way that destroys or at least greatly diminishes his goodness and his love. Remember, the three persons of the Godhead, now remember this, 
never work separately. If they did that, we'd have three gods. And we'd run around like chickens with our head cut off trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. They did not work separately. The Godhead never worked separately. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were always one. Amen? Always one. In your mind, in my mind, may we check out the hinges. I think that's so important. We need to check out our hinges and see how we're connected to the door that opens to the kingdom of God. Amen? Check out the hinges. Check out the screws. Check out the, the pins, the hinge pins. See, they can all go bad. You know, you ever have a hinge pin creep up until it finally gets so far out that it actually falls out? I have. You got to watch it. You got to keep an eye on it, you know. And every once in a while, you'll see it creep up an inch or two. Knock it back down. Get it back to where it belongs. Or the screws, that's obvious. When the screws start pulling out, then your door goes clunkety clunk clunk, you know, like mine is doing. May the door to the kingdom of God swing right open for you and yours. But not your way, God's way. Amen? Without all the rattling, without all the shuddering, and I mean DD, shuddering, the shaking, you go to close or open that door and it, you know, makes a lot of noise because it's not right. That's why you make it right. Amen? TMI, C-O-R, we've got to insist on God's understanding. Never insist on our own. Easter is not too far down the road, just a, what, a few weeks away at best. It's almost upon us, and we must be right with the one who is always right. And that's really what it comes down to. Amen? And he's more than willing to do that in you. He's not forcing you to do it on your own, in your own strength. He's willing to do it in us. Praise God. Amen? But you see something wrong with the hinge? Get on it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, you think I'm talking about you. No, I'm not. I, I, I got to get that hinge fixed and I'm going to do it tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Uh, and I um, just know that God in his mercy and in his grace is looking for a hinged people. A people that are attached to him. So that door opens and closes without all the racket. And, and is uh, in a place that it's supposed to be and working like it's supposed to be. So why? So that the door to the kingdom of God can open up for us and others. Amen? Without making a whole lot of fuss. Amen? You see what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. T-M-I-C-O-R 2.33. And that's important too, by the way. You make sure you got the right amount there too. <laughs> you know, in your checkbook and everything, if you want it to come out even, you're going to have to put, you know, you're going to have to make it come out right. Amen? Because, you know, you can work for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks trying to, and you just don't see it. And all of a sudden it'll come to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, I didn't see that before. Well, but go ahead and make it right. And then God will show it to you. <laughs> Amen? Besides, he, he'll, he'll do it however he wants to do it. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. He'll produce in us a hinged life. And that's what he wants. And that's what he, I say needs, but that's what he wants. Amen? Is a life that's hinged. Praise God. Connected. Working. Amen? Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Father, I want to thank you, dear God, for this truth here today. Help us, Lord, as we see 
going from hinge to hinge. And, and then at one point, Lord, literally going back to the first one, just to make sure, just to make sure, are you a king? Are you saying you are a king? Praise the Lord. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And he's, he's intending to be your king and my king. And I want to thank God today for this call upon every one of our hearts to be his people and to be always connected to him by way of these hinges and to make sure that we're hinged right. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We need you, Lord. We want you. And I know, Lord, you want us as well. So I pray, dear God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will be the one to lead us and guide us in the ways of everlasting life. We thank you and we love you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.